everybody. You're really welcome to the church again this morning. Special welcome if you've not been with us before. So people coming in, Let's grab some seats. So we're going to start off this morning by singing about a song really about Easter, foundational in Easter. The fact that because of what we remember next week uh, for Easter Sunday is the fact that we are forgiven because of what Christ did on the cross. And that's what we're going to sing about in our first song, which is Amazing Love. So uh, let's all stand to sing our first song, Amazing Love and Forgiven. Let's stand. Let's sing of the wonderful love that the Lord Jesus shared us on the cross. He was free of forgiven. He was forsaken. We were accepted. together as your church this morning we can sing about the great things that you've done for us and that this this easter time lord where we particularly think of that time when you went to the cross for us you bore those sins that we committed and you took the punishment that we deserve lord we are humbled by that and we pray that as we uh, spend time worshiping you and listening to your word opened up lord that you would uh, challenge us afresh um in our in our lives and in our relationship with you lord that we would want to grow it deeper and stronger lord and be motivated to go out there and do what you've commanded us to do in, in reaching the world and in reaching others with the great news of the gospel that, that we particularly remember at this time lord we pray as we um listen to the word opened up lord that you would help us help us to really uh listen to it carefully and take on board what it is that you're saying to each and every one of us we pray these things in your name amen, amen. All right, so what day is it today? Can anyone tell me? Special day today. 
Let's get some, some hands up, kids. <clears throat> or, yeah, Karen, do you know? It's some, what did you say? Someday, it's someday, that's the right answer. Any other answers? It's, it's, there's something, it's more than just a normal someday. Can anyone tell me? Especially if it's, e yes, Levi. Easter Sunday. It's not Easter Sunday, no. Any guesses? If I thought Easter Sunday was next Sunday, what would that make this Sunday? Ham Sunday, well done, right. I think we've got a picture. So, Ham Sunday. Now, Ham Sunday was when Jesus entered Jerusalem. And the people in Jerusalem thought they were getting a king, didn't they? They thought they were going to get somebody who was going to come and kick the Romans out. But what, may, what way would a king, back in those days, enter a city that he was about to take over? Do you think the picture that's up there would, uh, like a king would normally ride into a city like that? What, what's, what's a bit weird about that? Well, there's a few things, maybe. Elijah. He's riding on a donkey. He's riding on a donkey. Why is that a bit different? Um, kings normally have like chariots and stuff. Chariots and stuff, that's right. Or a horse. You know, I really, I really, um, maybe the best horse in the army, the strongest or the fastest. But Jesus comes in on a donkey. And it's because he's showing that this is not a normal, he is not a normal king. This is the king of kings. But he is humbling himself. He's riding in on a donkey. It's just an ordinary donkey. That's what he's coming into the city of Jerusalem for. And the people of Jerusalem were going to get something different from what they expected. This king was not going to kick out the Romans. He was going to do something far greater. And we're going to be thinking about that next weekend. At this point, these people have all these kind of ideas. They've come up with uh, all by themselves as to what they think Jesus is here to do, but he's come to do something a bit different. Um, and we're going to sing about that in our second song. So this song is all about Jesus entering Jerusalem and what it signified. Um, and now that we can look back on it, we can see how the people that got it wrong, because Jesus was coming not to throw the Romans out and establish a kingdom that way. He was coming to set up an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that would stretch forever because of what he was going to do on the cross a few days after this. So let's stand and sing, um, See Him in Jerusalem.
series in John this morning. So if you've got a Bible, uh, we're in John 15. And um, we're not going to have a rev in the front. We're going to watch one of the uh, Journey Through John videos that Foundation Matters have produced. So that's going to go on the screen in a second. But if you want to follow it along in your Bibles as well, then um, please feel free to do that. Thanks. Examine the evidence. Make your decision. Jesus and his disciples left the upper room where they were meeting, and it seems that they slowly made their way to a garden just outside Jerusalem. On their way, Jesus taught them a very important lesson. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. <coughs> remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If we are followers of Jesus, we are the branches, and we're connected to the vine, who is Jesus. Branches are quite weak in themselves, but if they are joined to the vine, they can be fruitful, they can be productive. The Father is the vine dresser who prunes the branches. When we follow Jesus, the journey can be painful at times, but through these difficulties, we can grow closer to Jesus and we can produce more and more fruit. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. If we don't spend time with Jesus regularly, listening to his word and putting it into practice, we become ineffective and our lives are wasted because there is no fruit. Jesus wants to have a close relationship with us so that our joy may be full and we can produce lasting fruit. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for, using my name. This is my command, love each other. Just as it takes time for branches to produce fruit, so it will take time for us to grow in our relationship with Jesus. For those of us who follow Jesus, we need to make it a priority to daily nourish ourselves with God's word so that we stay connected to Jesus. Only when we obey his command to love one another will his love be seen by others. Jesus was going to give himself in sacrificial love and that love is life-changing. <clears throat> All right, so we're doing about the vine and the branches this morning. Now, I went out into our back garden this morning and I couldn't actually find any vines and grapes. Surprise, surprise. I'm not sure whether uh, anyone else has managed to grow that in Derby, but I doubt it. 
So I have got a bit of our cherry blossom tree, which is a quite a good spot uh, in the year. Well, almost. Um, now you're gonna have to use your imagination a little bit because I wasn't I wasn't able to dig up the entire tree. So um, we're gonna have to pretend that what I've got is a tree. Okay. So we have got, if we imagine, the trunk of the tree. We've got lots of branches coming off it. Now, can anybody tell me where is, if we call the cherry blossom, or the, these little blossoms here, the fruit, where, what bit of the tree are they on? Can anyone tell me? Levi. The branch. They're on the branches, aren't they? Okay, so the Bible story, the, the message that we've got in, um, in John this morning is about the fact that when Jesus was here on earth, he sent us out us as his church to go and spread the message of the gospel around the world and in doing that he used he called that fruit and essentially that's uh, the fruit of our lives um, is seen by how we've done we've been obedient to what he's asked us to do now what it says is if i was to break one of these off like this do you think this one will blossom because you can see the little buds are still there can't you yeah. what do you think will happen if i just leave that here for a few days what will happen do you think it will come out with a nice pink flower like all the rest of it will what do you think any ideas what do you think Timmy? no it's not then why won't it why won't this little bit come out with nice pink flowers like the rest of it does any ideas yeah, Eliza. Because it's not connected. It's not connected, that's right. It's not connected. I've broken the connection between this little branch and the main bit of the tree. So uh, the branch needs all of the goodness that comes that the tree's roots draw up from the soil. It needs the water and it needs uh, the minerals that are needed for this to grow. Without that, this branch is useless. And as a result, it doesn't bear any fruit. And what, we need, what the passage is teaching us this morning is that we need to stay connected. We need to stay connected to God and to God's word. And by doing that, we will grow in him, which means we understand more about who he is and what he's done for us. And by doing that, we will become more fruitful for him because we will understand what he wants in our lives. So it's not good enough just to try our best to be good because that's not going to be good enough because we don't understand what God wants for us. It's only by being connected into him uh, that we will understand what that really means. So that's what this message is all about this morning. And you guys in a minute are going to be going out to Sunday Club and you're going to be learning a little bit more about that. And Naomi's going to be taking you through that. But before that, there was just one thing I wanted to remind you about. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Joseph set up his uh, Sunday Club library. And uh, we have enjoyed a couple of books out of it the last two weeks. And uh, don't forget, after the service, if you uh, if you want to go out, I think it's in the crash room. It's not in the crash room. It'll be in the green room. Okay, it'll be in the green room. He's all kitted out with um, little library slips and uh, stamp and everything. It's properly, professionally done. I was impressed, I have to say. Um, and uh, yeah, you can take it home and uh, you know, uh, read the books. There, there's books for loads of different age groups. Joseph has them all labelled up for different ages. Uh, and then after you finish, you can bring it back and get another one. Um, it's, yeah, it's really good. Actually, we've, we've built up quite a decent collection already. So I encourage you to go and have a look. And uh, we, we, we brought our two books back this morning. We managed to remember. And uh, we're going to swap them uh, for another couple. Um, but yeah, absolutely after the service. And um, get out there and have a look. Because um, there's lots of books to read, and it's just a good chance for us all to um, swap some really, really good Christian books um, between the families or older people. If you if you've got some spare that you don't use anymore, by all means bring them in, and we can add them to the library. And uh, yeah, a, a bit of an opportunity um, to you know um, get stuck into some some good books that maybe you wouldn't find in a normal library. So big thanks to Joseph for setting that up, and uh, I'm sure we we'll certainly be making use of that over the next few months. Um, but before that, um, we're going to sing our third song, and this is Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. Um, this just talks about the blessings that God pours out on us every single day. Despite the fact that he went to the cross, died for our sins, did something that no one else can ever do for us and has ever done for us, he continues to pour out blessings on each of us every day. And this is what this song talks about. Um, so this, at the end of this song, 
if you're primary school age, if you guys can head out to Sunday Club just at the end of this, this song. Thanks, Thanks Hannah. Just go through a few announcements. Um, so things are a bit different this week because it's uh, we're into the Easter holiday. Um, so yeah, evening service tonight at six as usual. Uh, there's no YP tonight, um, although there is just looking tomorrow, and uh, coffee morning is on as well. Um, for the next two weeks, we're not going to do a Wednesday night. Um, however, we are going to have a obviously a Good Friday service this coming Friday. Uh, so that's at ten thirty. So a little bit different time. Not ten forty-five. Ten thirty. 10.30, definitely turn 10.30, you know the screen. Um, 
yes, 10.30 next Friday, and then obviously back here for Easter Sunday uh, next week. A um, couple of uh, special things happening this week. Um, there is a baptism class, so we've been announcing this for the last few weeks. So if you're interested in baptism or learning a bit more about baptism, maybe not necessarily at the end of this time, but um, we're going to do two of these baptism classes. Classes maybe sounds a bit formal. It's going to be a bit of a chat about what baptism means and what we as a church believe uh, in believers' baptism and what, what that means and the, the sort of evidence for that in the Bible. Um, that's going to be at half four in here in church this afternoon. Uh, and then in two weeks' time, it's going to be the second one of those. Um, so if you're interested in baptism, have a chat to one of us or, or turn up at half four this afternoon, that's fine. Um, and yeah, you'll get, get to learn a little bit more about baptism and what it means. Um, but if you are a believer uh, and you haven't been baptised, I really encourage you um, to think seriously about that. It is an important part of um, what we believe uh, uh, as Christians we should, we should be doing to sort of publicly declare um, our trust and our faith in the Lord. Um, there are also, um, as usual, going to be some leaflets. Uh, we're not going to meet and do it all in one evening this time um, so as of probably Tuesday morning there will be leaflets available in the foyer if you don't have a key to the church then um, well we'll, we might not be a bike but uh, so get in touch with one of the key holders Pete or someone and uh, grab a few leaflets or or if uh, you can get some directly off Gem, they're going to be available um, there'll be a map so you can mark off what you've done uh, around the estate uh, and so from Tuesday morning onwards, those leaflets will be available and it's, it's just so that people can do it in the time that suits them this week. Um, obviously, before Good Friday, if possible, because uh, obviously that's the first day of events. Um, uh, there is no, yeah, that reminds me actually, there's no Explorers uh, or Life, uh, obviously because the schools are off and that'll be for two weeks. So no Explorers this week or, or next week. Um, and I think, is that everything? Anything else? Oh, there was one more thing actually. Um, I'm sure people are aware, but uh, congratulations to Rachel and Chris who got married on Friday. Um, Rachel Lancaster. Don't actually know where her surname is now. But, uh, <laughs> um, so that was last Friday. So we can uh, keep them in our prayers um, as they enter into married life together. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's turn turn to prayer now. Um, sorry. Could I share yeah. a prayer request, please? Absolutely. Some of you, it's been a while since uh, he came here, but my former brother-in-law, Andy Kemp, um, some of, quite a few of you do know him. Um, as you know, uh, those of you who do know him know, uh, Andy struggled with alcoholism for some years, and he was admitted to hospital with multiple organ failure uh, yesterday, and he died during the night. Um, and so uh, um, Phoebe was able to get back up from London, and Phoebe and Cameron were with him at the end, <coughs> and the other children had been there before. So that's Phoebe, Cameron, Gregor and Imogen, and uh, of course, um, and his father, Ken, who's I think 90 or 91, who he was living with at the end. Uh, we follow on prayers. Thank you. Thanks for that, Dave. Okay, yeah, let's turn to prayer. Lord, we come to you again this morning, and uh, we recognize that you're the King of Kings and the Lord, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You entered the city of Jerusalem in such a humble way uh, and such an example of um, how you were willing to humble yourself um, and do what needed to be done um, to save humanity. Um, and once again, we turn to you as uh, we look out of the world with uh, so little hope uh, and so much death and destruction ongoing. Lord, we look to the country of Ukraine that continues to suffer so much. Um, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ out there, Lord, who, um, you know, we hear worrying reports of them being targeted, Lord, and, um, you know, clearly uh, among the refugees who are fleeing from that, that violence, Lord, and we, as, as we pray for the last few weeks, we're, we're praying big prayers again, again this morning, Lord, that uh, it looks like a, such an intractable situation that there's no obvious solution to um, in the short term, and we pray, Lord, that, that you would you would be moving behind the scenes. You would be changing the minds of, of Putin and others who are making the decisions uh, to continue this war, Lord, that uh, the tanks would be turned around, Lord, uh, and that we, we would see um, peace return to that country, Lord. Um, we pray for the people uh, working out there um, and delivering aid and supplies 
Um, some of whom we can't mention, Lord, uh, uh, but we know the work that's going on behind the scenes. And we pray that you would really bless that work, the work that's going on amongst the refugees in Poland and the other countries surrounding Ukraine, Lord. Um, and yeah, we pray, pray for uh, the refugees coming over here as well. We pray that you would ease their passage and that um, yeah, they would they would be able to settle uh, and and get over the the trauma that they've they've gone through, Lord. Um, yeah, we thank you that we can turn to you, a God of hope, uh, that we have as Christians, uh, a hope that transcends all understanding in the future, Lord, because of what you have done for us, Lord. This isn't a, an uncertain hope, a sort of fingers crossed that it'll all be okay. This is a sure and a certain hope because of what you've done for us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to communicate that to the outside world, that they would see in us, that we would be salt and light in this community, and that they would see something different in us, that we do have this hope in the future, Lord, that we are, are we have built our lives on a sure foundation of you, and that we are connected into that vine that supplies us with everything we need. And even though, as we've just been singing, times will be tough, particularly as Christians, we can expect hard times ahead, that we have you to carry us through those times. And we pray that we would rely on you on difficult times in life, and we, we pray for um, this family that's been bereaved overnight. We pray for Phoebe and we pray for Ken in particular and the wider family, Lord, that, that you would really be with them at this difficult time, um, this loss that they've suffered. And um, Lord, that they would put their hope in you, Lord, that it is only you that can um, you know, make sense from death. It is something that as a society and, and as humanity, we, we struggle with to process so much what what you know how, how this can happen and how how loved ones can be torn away from us so quickly lord and we thank you for your word that we have and and that we can see that this is never how you intended the world to be um, and we thank you for the hope that we can look forward to where death um, is gone once and for all but equally as we look towards easter and we look towards next week when we remember the time when you defeated death that death doesn't need to have a sting for us anymore. There's no fear in death, and um, there is only hope in the future. Um, and we pray that as Christians and as a church, we would cling to that, Lord, um, and that we would, um, yeah, really want to grow and deepen our knowledge of you, um, because of the hope that we enjoy uh, as a result of that. Um, we we pray for Rachel and Chris, Lord, as as they embark on married life. We thank you um, for the joy of that wedding on, on Friday, and um, pray that you'd be with them, Lord, um, and and that. Uh, yeah, they would, they would uh, um, in their married life, really uh, grow together. Uh, and um, yeah, they, they would uh, really know the, the, the presence of you in their relationship as well. Um, and we pray for, uh, we, we pray for uh, Paul and Susan, who've gone out to uh, Papua New Guinea. We thank you that they've, they've made it out there safely. Um, we thank you for uh, the fact that you've opened up that door to allow them to get back and they've, they've struggled to get back so often over the last few years with COVID and um, we know that that church uh, sorely needs them out there. We pray for the translation work that is ongoing uh, in the tribe and, and the progress that they're making on, on translating your word into the local language. We thank you for their faithfulness in you and um, how they've been so consistent in, in looking to support um, that people group over such a long time and we pray for for Paul and Susan in particular that you would strengthen them that they wouldn't face any setbacks when they're out there that you would the local church leadership would continue to grow in you and go from strength to strength and and be able to take on that responsibility for uh, shepherding and discipling the the people there um yeah we pray pray for safety for them pray that this would be a really productive time that they have out in, in PNG um and yeah you'd really be with them and, and bless that work and uh, we pray for Pete as he as he comes to bring your word to us now. We pray that you would be um, really challenging us in what it is you, that you have to say to us. That uh, Lord, as we think about um, our relationship with you and the fact that that you want us to be connected into you, that you would be challenging us to what Pete has to say to us, um, to to really renew and uh, our commitment to you, and uh, that we would be seeking to make this a habit. Uh, of, of reading your word, of spending time in prayer, and, and really growing to know what you have for us uh, as we go into the week ahead. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll hand over to Pete Kine.
Yes, as we uh, pray for Ukraine, just a big thank you to all those who gave towards our Ukraine gift. We um, have sent just under £4,000 to our Christian brothers and sisters over there, £3,943 uh, in um, split into three or four gifts over the last uh, 40 odd days. So thank you for all those who gave towards that. And as Alan says, do continue to pray for uh, that situation over there. And one other thing, um, the Queen's Jubilee is coming up. We're hoping to have a street party down the church drive on Friday the 3rd of June. And if anybody would like to join in the planning for that, uh, do let me know. We'll try and get together in the next week or so when we get Easter out of the way and get our heads together and put some ideas together for how we might organise a street party here on Bank Holiday Friday the 4th of June. So uh, do put your thinking caps on. If you'd like to get involved in delivering and organising that, let me know and we'll meet up and plan out how we do that on, for that Bank Holiday Friday in early June. If you've got a Bible, do have it open at John 15. Years ago, a mother was walking across the hills of South Wales. She was carrying her baby when she was overtaken and overcome by a blizzard. When the storm finished, Sadly, her body was found beneath a mound of snow. But before she died, she'd taken off her outer clothing and she wrapped it around her baby. When it was unwrapped, the baby was found alive and well. Years later, that child, David Lloyd George, became Prime Minister of Great Britain and one of our greatest statesmen. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down their life for their friend. And that's the famous statement that Jesus gives here in John 15 that we have read to us earlier. Which of course is exactly what Jesus is about to do, isn't he? But before he does that, he gives his soon-to-be-left-alone disciples a wonderful picture here in verse 1. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, if you've been following this series through John's Gospel, you'll know that this is the seventh and final of these I am statements that Jesus gives here in John's Gospel. Of course, vineyards were important to the life and the economy of the country and nation of Israel. And in the Old Testament of, of the Bible, the nation of Israel is depicted as a vine. But that vine had destroyed itself by its disobedience. And consequently, if you know your Old Testament history, God had to deal with the nation of Israel. He had to chastise it. But sadly, even that didn't produce lasting results. So when we come to John 15, where Jesus now speaks of the vine, this image, this picture that he's using, wasn't something that was new to his Jewish listeners. They were very familiar with the picture of the vine. As Alan and Johnny on the video have already told us, uh, Christians, we, if we know and love the Lord, we're branches in the vine of heaven because we depend upon the Lord Jesus. You see, in the New Testament, the vine is the Lord Jesus. And of course, a vine includes us if we know and love him as the branches, his followers. He's the true vine. We have a living relationship to Jesus. We belong to him in just the same way as he's the head of the body, the church. And we're members of that body. Now in the Holy Land, unlike over here in Alan's back garden, in the Holy Land, vines 
were prolific. They were large. They were healthy, many of them. They were strong. And it was just about impossible to break off a branch, a mature branch, without damaging that vine. But did you notice, as uh, we have read on the video, what word kept appearing over and over again here as John 15 was read to us? It's the word remain. It's used 11 times in the first 11 verses. Some translations use the word abide or the word continue. Here they are on the screen. Don't worry if you can't read or see all of this. But see how often this word remain crops up over and over and over again. 11 times. Verse 4. Remain in me, Jesus said, and I also remain in you. Verse 4 again. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Again, verse 4. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Verse 6. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Verse 7. If you, there it is again, remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Verse 9. Remain in my life. You get the drift? Over and over and over again. Again in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will remain. You know, it's repetition. It's it's like a stuck record, isn't it? You see the message that Jesus is wanting to get over 11 times in the first 11 verses. You see, as branches, we have all the wonderful benefits of sharing in the life of the Lord Jesus if we know and love him. But we also have the responsibility of remaining or abiding in Jesus. So what does it mean to remain? Well, remaining in Jesus means a living relationship so that we bear fruit. The vine, it's a functional plant, isn't it? It exists solely to bear fruit. Somebody described it like this when they said, the vine lives to give its lifeblood. Its flower is small, but its fruit is abundant. And when that fruit is mature, the vine has become, for a moment, glorious. The treasure of the grapes is torn down <coughs> and the vine is cut right back to the stem. You see, it's a functional plant. It's not one that you grow in a garden to sit and observe the beauty and to smell and scent. No, it's functional. Its purpose is reflected in its fruits. And that picture is taken by Jesus here. That fruit-bearing nature of the vine is what Jesus is drawing on here. And drawing to our attention in verses 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 8 and verse 16. That fruit bearing characteristic of the vine. Here's an example, verse 5. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruits. You see, remaining in Jesus means to stay in fellowship, in communion, in contact with him, so that he can work through us, so we bear fruit. And of course, as Johnny's already showed us on the video, that involves the word of God, the Bible. It involves us keeping in close contact with the Lord, confessing our, our wrongdoing, so that nothing hinders our relationship with God. Listen to how Jesus puts it in verse 3. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. You see, 
remaining in Jesus involves us obeying him because we love him. That's what he goes on to say in verses 9 and 10. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Jesus is saying here that all that will lead to fruitfulness in our lives. You see, we need to remember that we're the branches. We don't eat the fruits. Other people do. You get the drift? You understand what Jesus is saying here? We're branches. We're not the fruits. We don't exist for the sake of just having fruit. No, we exist as branches to bear fruit for others. We aren't producing fruit just to please ourselves, but to serve other people. Now that is what we sometimes call counter-cultural. We live in a society that exists for itself. We grow up in a world where we're taught, where we're uh, led to believe that everything revolves around me. I'm the centre of the universe. It's me, me, me. Jesus isn't saying that here. He's turning the whole thing on its head. He's saying, we don't exist to eat our own fruit. We're the branches. So that we bear fruit, not for ourselves, but for others, to the glory of God. And that is a very profound lesson that comes out here in John 15. We aren't producing fruit to please ourselves, if we are Christian this morning. But we should pre be producing fruits to serve others. That's why some of us turn up on a Tuesday morning to help coffee morning. That's why others turn up on a Friday morning to help Smiley Talk, and others on a Friday night to help Explorers, and others on a Saturday night to help deliver a teenage life group, and, and so on and so forth, that we might bear fruits for the benefit of others. We should be the kind of people who are feeding others by our words and our works. Or if you like, as Proverbs 10.21 puts it, the lips of the righteous feed many. That's how Proverbs sums that idea up. So what does that fruit look like? Well, in Romans 1, you needn't turn to it, but it says we bear fruit <coughs> when we win other people, when we introduce other people to the Lord Jesus. Or as Romans 6 puts it, we grow, as we grow in holiness and obedience, we're bearing fruits. Or as Romans 15 puts it, Paul considered Christian giving of our time and our wealth and our finances and our energies as giving, as being fruit to the glory of God. Or as Galatians 5, maybe a more well-known passage puts it, the fruit of the Spirit, the kind of Christian characteristics that God wants to see in our lives for his honour and his glory. Or if you like, as Colossians 1 puts it in, in the New Testament, doing good is bearing fruits <laughs> for God's glory. One more example from Hebrews 13. Praising God, like we've done this morning, as we've been singing together. Praising God is fruit to his glory. You see, a true branch remaining with the vine will always bear fruits. Because there will always be fruits where there's life. The two things go together, don't they? Indeed, as Jesus goes on to tell us here, 
If there's no fruit, as Jesus says in verse 2, the branch is worthless and it's cut down and, and discarded. So what's the secret of a fruitful Christian life? Well, as all you budding gardeners, I'm sure, will know, it takes time, doesn't it, to cultivate and produce fruits. A good crop doesn't occur overnight. As we've seen here in verse 2, Jesus tells us the secret of fruitfulness is that pruning, that, that cutting down. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he, br he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they produce even more fruit. I guess if you're like me, many of us as Christians will pray that we become more fruitful. But I wonder if we're really up for the pruning process that goes with that. You see, sometimes God allows trials, doesn't he, and tests in our lives to strengthen us and to mould us into the people he wants us to be. So through that pruning process, we become more fruitful. I think I may have used this illustration before, but in the 19th century, the only way to get uh, to ship fish from the North Atlantic, the cod from Boston to San Francisco, was to sail around the South American continent. It took months, and you can imagine the first attempts to dress the cod in Boston. An ice packet failed miserably. The fish were inedible by the time they got to California. The next attempt, the cod were placed in holding tanks in those ships, in water. And at least they were alive when they reached California. But when they were dressed and prepared for sale, they were still disappointing. And the fish didn't get much exercise in the tanks. They were pasty and relatively tasteless. Fit only for McDonald's. <laughs> Who knows? But then someone had a bright idea. Why don't we put some catfish in with the cod? And that was a clever idea. You see, catfish are the natural enemy of cod. So when a few catfish were put in those tanks on those ships, in amongst all the cod, the cod kept swimming for dear life to avoid the catfish. And when they reached San Francisco, yeah, there were a few cod that were missing, but the ones that remained were in perfect shape. The catfish had kept the cod on their toes, so they remained, remained healthy and strong. And that is exactly why God, the vine dresser, prunes us as branches on his vine to make us stronger and healthier. So we become more fruitful, more like the Lord Jesus, more like the people he wants us to be. Yes, at times it might be painful, at times it might be challenging, but that's God's ambition, that we might bear more fruit for his glory. But notice the progression here in these opening verses of John 15. <coughs> Verse 2 starts by speaking of no fruit. Then notice in verse 2, it talks about some fruit. And then at the end of verse 2, more fruit. And then verse 5, much more fruit. And verse 8, much more fruit. You see the progression as Jesus goes through this picture of the vine from no fruit to some fruit to more fruit to much more fruit to much more fruits. You see, as vine dresser, our Heavenly Father does two things to ensure there'll be as much fruit as possible in your life and mine if we know and love Him this morning. In winter, He cuts off the dry and withered branches. 
In spring, he removes the worthless fruits so that what's left becomes stronger and grows. Some branches he clears off. Some he cleans up. A more drastic case is referred to in verse 6, where Jesus says some branches who don't remain in him end up in the fire. He may well have had Judas in mind here, who appeared as a branch, like any other follower of Jesus. We were thinking of Judas over the last two Sundays, weren't we? But as soon as he was exposed as withered and dead, fit only to be discarded. And sadly, within every group of Christians, there may well be those who at last will be exposed as dead. Which is why in 2 Peter 2.10, we're urged to make our calling an election sure. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So remaining in Jesus, a living relationship. But secondly, notice this, it's a loving relationship. You see, this passage here in John 15 isn't just all about remaining in Jesus. It's also all about love. Check it out, verse 9. Remain in my love, Jesus says. Verse 9 and verse 12. I have loved you. And in that well-known statement in verse 13, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then verses 14 and 15, you are my friends. You see, Jesus reminds us here that he loves us. And then he encourages us to remain in his love. What a loving heavenly father we've got. Do you realise this morning that you're loved by Almighty God? It's a wonderful relationship we can enjoy to know and love and be loved by the great Creator God. And of course, it's because God loves us that he prunes us to encourage us to bear more fruits for his glory. And we need to remain in his love. But I love the way Jesus preempts the question, so how do we do that? How do I remain in his love? Notice how he answers that in verse 10. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. In the previous chapter, in chapter 14, as we saw last week, Jesus summed it up this way, where he simply says, If you love me, keep my commands. You see, obedience is the way and the proof that we're remaining in God's love. How we need to ask ourselves the question as to whether we're obeying the Lord in our lives. But I want you to notice something else about God's love here in this passage. In verse 11, you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. overflow. The consequence of being loved by God. Jesus has already spoken about peace in the previous chapter and now he moves on to love and joy and of course love joy peace are the first three fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5 you see remaining or abiding in Jesus should certainly produce his love, joy and peace in your life and mine if we know and love him this morning. 
a loving relationship so we can enjoy him. Because we love him, we'll want to keep his commands. And as we keep his commands, we abide in his love and experience it in a deeper way. Remaining in Jesus means a loving relationship so we enjoy him. What a great privilege to live within the sphere of God's love. But what an awesome responsibility. How we need to reach out to those who are outside of God's love. That we might bear fruits for their benefits. You see, let's, re let's remind ourselves, there's a lot of hurting people out there, aren't there? This came home to me the other day when I read this in the Beach Team newsletter. It's an email they received recently and it simply said this. The Beach Team organised activities, some of you may well know, having been involved in them for children around some of the beaches of this country and others in Europe. And the email they received in their office said this. I was just talking about something and it caused me to remember the beach team. And I wanted to thank you. I grew up in the 80s and 90s in St Ives in Cornwall. Very poor and very miserable. And I know some of you, myself included, have been on those beach teams in St Ives over the years. And this person writes, I would later leave my family and go into the comparative safety of foster care. For years, I saw you, all summer, every day, and I knew I could come within the rope on the beach and I would be welcomed and entertained. I needed you so much and you never knew. I'm 41 years old now. Thank you for 30 years ago. You see, there's a needy world out there, isn't there? Who desperately need the benefits of the love of God in their lives. They desperately need to see the fruits of God's love through our lives. And that's what Jesus is driving at here with this picture of the vine. You see, this passage is more than just our inward relationship with the Lord. Yes, it does remind us of that, but it's a lot more than that. Its primary purpose and real thrust is that renewal of God's mission through his Son and us, his followers. If we know and love the Lord, we're his disciples, he sends us out into his world. Just as Jesus went out into this world to carry on his task in his absence, to bear fruits. That's the principal implication here of Jesus saying in verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. That's why in verse 8 it tells us that the purpose of our fruit bearing is to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. To seek the glory of God will therefore bring with it a commitment to mission, local and worldwide. As you go through the New Testament, you find that worship and evangelism, outreach, sharing the love of Jesus, come together. They become one. As verse 8 tells us, it's by involvement in that mission and becoming fruit bearers that we show ourselves to be genuine followers of Jesus. You see, true grace is never idle, is it? But you know what amazes me about God's love? It's unconditional. That's wonderful, isn't it? There's no small print. Jesus elaborates on this in verse 13 with that famous statement, 
There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, which is exactly what he was about to do the next day there in Jerusalem. Because he said all this the night before he was crucified, as he prepares his disciples to go it alone. It's unbelievable, isn't it? That when God's own son came to Israel, his vineyard, they rejected him and eventually killed him. Just as Jesus had predicted in that parable to the, of the tenants in Matthew 21, where in effect they say, we will not have this man to rule over us. I wonder this morning, do you allow the Lord Jesus to become your Lord and your Saviour? Or are you still saying, I will not have this man Jesus to be king of my life? Well, finally, the third thing that comes out in this passage is a lasting relationship. So we don't need to fear. You see, this word remain that comes up 11 times here, it's got a wonderful, I don't know, a wonderful longevity to it, hasn't it? When Jesus says in verse 4, I will remain in you, that should bring us great comfort and great peace. Because it speaks of a, a lasting relationship. So we need never be afraid if we know and love the Lord Jesus. It's a relationship that lasts through life and on into eternity. A few chapters earlier in John 10, we saw, didn't we, how Jesus put it this way, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. <coughs> no one can snatch them out of my hand. John 10, 28. You see, the sooner we, as Christians, if we know and love this morning, the Lord this morning, the sooner we realise that we're merely branches, the better we relate to the vine, the Lord Jesus. For we'll know that our own weaknesses We'll know them, we'll confess them, we'll bring them to the Lord. We'll seek his strength. Never forget, we're just the branches. He's the vine. We belong to him, we're part of him. We're attached to him. You see, in and of itself, a branch is worthless, it's useless. It's limited either for bearing fruit or burning. But it's no use for building. You don't build houses and log cabins out of vine wood, do you? Not at all. And what's more, on our own as branches, we can't bear fruits. We need to draw life from the vine, but that's a lasting relationship. It's our communion, our link to Jesus that's all important through the Spirit. That's what makes fruit bearing possible. Many of the images in the Bible of Jesus and his followers emphasize this important idea of union and communion. The body and its members, 1 Corinthians 12, the bride, and the bridegroom, Ephesians 5, the shepherd and the sheep, John 10. If a member of the body is cut off, it dies. Or putting it another way, it's marriage that creates the union, but it takes daily love and devotion to maintain the communion in that relationship. Or the shepherd brings the sheep into the flock. But they must follow him to have provision and protection. 
You see, if we know and love the Lord this morning, we don't just have a union with Jesus. We have, or should have, communion, day by day, fellowship with him. In other words, we should be abiding or remaining in him. It's a lasting relationship with Jesus. So we've nothing to fear. We don't need to be afraid of what tomorrow might bring. We don't even need to worry that a conflict in Ukraine might spread across Europe. Sad though that might would be. You see, we need to remember this world is not our home. We're just passing through. During which time we should be remaining in the Lord Jesus. Because that lasting relationship means we've nothing to fear. Because we belong to him. So we're branches in the vine. What a privilege to belong or to remain in the Lord Jesus. But what an awesome responsibility to bear fruits. I guess the question is, am I remaining? Am I bearing fruits? Am I trusting the Lord as he prunes my life so that I become more fruitful? As we do so, we'll experience his joy as we abide in him. Let's finish, shall we, by singing when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, there's the obedience. He abides or he remains with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Let's stand to see. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Oh